The Cure aren't exactly known for their light lyrics and breezy vibes, but with a story like this, who could blame them? The themes found in The Cure's music could probably be described as some combination of melancholy, heartbreak, and tragedy. And those difficult emotions aren't only a major element of the band's style, they're also responsible for the group's very existence. After the spare post-punk of 1979's Three Imaginary Boys, The Cure fully embraced their gloomy sonic atmosphere on 1980's 17 Seconds. In the liner notes on a later reissue of the album, Robert Smith said, It was the first record I felt was really The Cure. In 1981, The Cure's mood and music darkened even more. Around the same time, Smith's grandmother unexpectedly died, while drummer Lowell Tolhurst's mother was diagnosed with the cancer that would eventually claim her life. Smith himself was also dealing with persistent thoughts of meaningless and impending death. Years later, he told Uncut, I was 21, but I felt really old, older than I do now. I had no faith in anything. I genuinely felt that I wasn't going to be alive for much longer. I tried particularly hard to make sure I wasn't. Adding to the despair, hopelessness, and suicidal ideation was the May 1980 death of a British post-punk contemporary, Ian Curtis. Smith later remembered, The whole thing was reinforced by the fact that Ian Curtis had killed himself. I knew that The Cure were considered fake in comparison. If I wanted people to accept what we were doing, I was going to have to take the ultimate step. Still, it's not all doom and gloom, as Smith says. The songs that are serious are serious and the songs that aren't aren't. In July 1986, The Cure was scheduled to play the Forum outside Los Angeles, California for the final concert on the 17-date U.S. Beach Party Tour. As the members of the band gathered before the show, and as the crowd's excitement grew, a 38-year-old concert-goer named Jonathan Moreland jumped up, removed a hunting knife he'd hidden on his person, and stabbed himself. Some fans urged him on apparently thinking that his attempted suicide was staged theater befitting the gloomy music and imagery of The Cure. Security and police personnel acted quickly to stop Moreland from killing himself. In the documentary Never Enough, one of the band's crew members said, I saw the commotion and heard screaming and the crowd clearing as the guy jumped onto his seat. It was surreal and disturbing. Moreland later admitted that he was depressed over an unrequited love. It's long been rumored that he died in the hospital after the concert, but contemporary news reports stated he was in good condition the day after the incident. In March 1987, The Cure visited South America for the first time, kicking off a tour leg with two shows at a stadium in Buenos Aires, Argentina. When the band arrived at the airport, they were mobbed by fans. A crowd of at least 500 had waited for them outside the hotel. On the first night of the two-night stand, Organizers discovered that the concert had more than sold out. About 19,000 tickets had been purchased for a venue that only held 17,000 people. When thousands of fans were turned away at the gates, a riot broke out. Police cars arriving on the scene were destroyed by fans. Multiple security dogs died in the fracas, and a hot dog vendor became so distressed that he suffered a fatal heart attack. The cure took the stage anyway, and the riot raged on inside the stadium. Robert Smith later remembered, for almost two hours, we play amidst deafening bedlam before rushing off, screaming into the car and away. According to a local newspaper report, three people died that night. On night two, as temperatures reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit, enhanced security and imposing barricades placed by the stage couldn't prevent another riot. Smith claims to have seen law officers engulfed in flames while the crowd threw objects at the band. After being struck in the face with a soda bottle, Smith rushed through the rest of the set and got the band out of there. From The Cure's early days, drummer turned keyboardist Lowell Tolhurst exhibited problems with alcohol. The band was removed from its first high-profile showcase, opening for Billy Idol's band Generation X, after a drunk Tolhurst entered a bathroom and urinated on Idol, who was in the middle of an intimate act with a fan. During The Cure's 1987 tour of South America, Tolhurst's drinking problem had gotten to the point that he was consistently intoxicated, meaning he couldn't play the band's songs particularly well. As a result, the band hired supplemental keyboardist Roger O'Donnell, formerly of the Psychedelic Furs. Meanwhile, the rest of the band members took out their frustrations and anger on Tolhurst, who was reportedly too drunk to ever defend himself. Following an 18-month hiatus at tour's end and the recording of the album Disintegration, the Cure fired Tolhurst due to his issues with addiction. He later told Billboard, 
I was most certainly disintegrating. Emotionally and physically, it was all falling apart. It would have ended in tears completely, yeah, and, and probably not just mine. Shortly after his exit, Tullhurst filed a lawsuit against his former band, alleging that he'd been unfairly removed. He also claimed that he had been coerced into an agreement entitling him to a low royalty rate of 2% on Cure recordings. During proceedings, Smith testified to Tullhurst's inability to function in a professional capacity due to his drinking, citing how the keyboardist put colored stickers on his instrument as a tool to help himself remember what notes to play. Tolhurst retorted with examples of pervasive alcohol use throughout the band, including the time the group accumulated $3,000 in booze charges on a European rail trip. The judge ultimately ruled in favor of the cure, agreeing with the band that Tolhurst's drinking had affected his musicianship. Even worse for the former cure member, he'd racked up legal bills to the tune of $1 million, and it took him 10 years to fully erase his debt. At one point, the British government confiscated 75% of his wages which had declined significantly after he left The Cure. Bassist Michael Dempsey was an original member of The Cure. His time in the band dates back to 1976, when they were nothing more than a high school trio known as The Easy Cure. Dempsey departed The Cure after the release of its first album, Three Imaginary Boys, in 1979, and later joined The Associates, a pop-oriented new romantic group who scored a string of hits in the UK. The Associates had previously toured with The Cure and poached Dempsey away. Nevertheless, the two acts remained on good terms, with Smith singing backup on the Associates' song, The Affectionate Punch. Members of The Cure and The Associates alike were devastated when, in January 1997, the latter band's lead singer, Billy McKenzie, died. During a period in which he had attempted to revive a dormant career, McKenzie died by suicide. He was just 39 years old. After contributing as a guest to The Cure's 1997 single, Wrong Number, and playing with Robert Smith in the side project Cogasm, Reeves Gabriels officially joined the band in 2012. In the decades prior, Gabriels had built an illustrious career as an alternative rock guitarist. None other than David Bowie helped him land his earliest gigs before hiring him to play in his hard rock outfit, Tin Machine. How are you all getting on? Is it all working out all right, Tin Machine? We have color problems. During the 1990s, Gabriels was Bowie's main guitarist, both on stage and on record. Gabriels wrote dozens of songs with Bowie, too, before breaking away from the rock legend in the early 2000s to pursue other musical avenues. In January 2016, Bowie unexpectedly died just days after his 69th birthday, the cause of death, cancer, the diagnosis of which hadn't been publicly disclosed. Gabriels participated in the global movement of mourning and tributes for his friend and collaborator, he told NPR. We shared apartments together, we borrowed socks from each other. The picture I have in my head is of him cracking up in the studio, because we just used to be able to make each other laugh. In the 2010s, the Cure frontman Robert Smith landed a position as the curator of Meltdown Festival, an annual band showcase that featured nearly 100 bands playing in multiple London venues over a 10-day period. Smith picked every last one of them. One of the acts that Smith had personally selected to play the 2018 Meltdown Festival was Frightened Rabbit, a Scottish indie pop rock band fronted by Scott Hutchison. About a month before Frightened Rabbit was set to take the stage, however, Hutchison was reported missing. Two days later, the body of the 36-year-old musician was found in a waterway outside Edinburgh. Hutchison had a history of depression, and his death was ruled to have been a suicide. Smith felt the loss deeply. He told Time Out, It's awful. I've been listening to them for 10 years. I've never met him, but I feel I know him because of his voice. The Cure put out albums regularly throughout the 1980s and 1990s. As of 2023, the band's last studio album was their 13th, 413 Dream, which was released in 2008. In 2019, everyone in The Cure but Robert Smith had completed their contributions to a record called Live from the Moon. A few years later, however, Smith suggested that the title might not be as locked down as he once thought. Oh. I'll tell you what it's called. Yeah. It's called Songs of a Lost World. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Smith admitted to the Los Angeles Times that his negligence in laying down his vocal tracks was to blame for holding up the album's release. There is one other reason the band hasn't released an album since 2008, however. Smith lost his passion for music. It was only after he was asked to curate Meltdown Festival that he rediscovered his spark. Smith said, 
I was offered the chance to curate the Meltdown Festival and I said yes. So I threw myself headlong into it and started listening to bands again and meeting kids who were in bands and something clicked inside my head. I want to do this again. It came as a bit of a shock to me, to be honest. That said, the upcoming album could be one of the bleakest The Cure has ever recorded. Smith says, It's very much on the darker side of the spectrum. I lost my mother and my father and my brother recently, and obviously it had an effect on me. After the recording of the 1982 album Pornography, Lowell Tolhurst moved over to keyboards, necessitating the addition of a new drummer, Clifford Andy Anderson. Andy's work first appeared on the single The Love Cats and the 1984 album The Top. Andy left The Cure shortly thereafter. Anderson also recorded and performed with other major acts before and after his stint in The Cure, including Peter Gabriel, Iggy Pop, and Hawkwind. In February 2019, Anderson announced in a Facebook post that he'd been diagnosed with an especially aggressive form of stage 4 cancer. He wrote, There is no way of returning back from that. It's totally covering the inside of my body, and I'm totally fine and aware of my situation. Nine days later, Anderson's former Cure bandmate, Lowell Tolhurst, broke the news of Anderson's death. He wrote on Twitter, I just heard from some friends who were there with Andy as he passed. It is a small measure of solace to learn that he went peacefully at his home. Anderson was 68. Drummer Jason Cooper began his three-decade-long tenure in The Cure in the mid-1980s. For many of those years, his primary drum technician was Paul Ricky Welton. During the band's 2019 tour, however, Welton suffered an unexpected and serious cardiac event. He was hospitalized and died just days later, on August 23, 2019. The following evening, The Cure played the Rock on Seine Festival in France. The band concluded its set with an emotional tribute to Welton, playing Boys Don't Cry in the drum tech's honor. For the remainder of the tour's concert, the band and crew left a stool with a beer on it just behind the drum set, as that's where Welton always sat during shows. In June 2022, Cooper took part in the 54-mile London to Brighton bike ride, a charity event to raise money for the British Heart Foundation, which the drummer rode in his tech's honor. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988 or by calling 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255.